thank you very much for joining um, us in this conference. Um, it's 2.30, it's 2.10 in Hong Kong time. It's, uh, I'm at Frankfurt and it's 8.10 a.m. here. So um, thank you very much for all of the row from joining and welcome very much to um, the, the session. Um, as with usual, I'll briefly introduce the session and then I'll start off. Um, if you come from um, uh, because of the advertisement in the Hong Kong Lawyer Journal, you'll find this session very interesting because I know several presentations in this panel are featured in that article. Uh, we'll have four speakers in this panel. Um, as usual, this panel is recorded, um, so uh, please be aware of that when you are speaking or uh, trying to uh, switch on your video. Um, the duration for each presentation will be 15 to 20 minutes, and I will encourage speakers to also leave around 5 to 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, the time is strict, we have to stop at a uh, 25 minutes time mark and then we'll pass on to the next speaker. So um, for questions, please send your questions to the Q&A to me and then I'll read them out um, during the Q&A session. Uh, but you're also welcome to, I think it's possible to send you directly to the speaker if you want to, um, but it will be good to have uh, everyone's wisdom um, together in this session. Um, so perhaps let me start by uh, introducing the first speaker, uh, which is Professor Helena uh, Willenbridge. Um, she will be talking about assessment fund, tailoring assessments to learning goals, which I think is a very interesting topic and is indeed featured in the article. Uh, Helena is Associate Professor of Law at the National University of Singapore, and uh, much about her bio, as with other speakers, can be found on the conference website. Uh, without, ado without further ado, can I pass on to the time to Helena? Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Wilson, for that uh, introduction. And thank you to everybody for your interest uh, in the session and in the paper. Um, apologies uh, in advance. Uh, I do have a cold, as you may be able to tell. And uh, I hope that it uh, doesn't uh, really interfere with my voice. So apologies for, for any of that. Uh, OK, I'll go to screen share now. And uh, everybody should be able to see a PowerPoint it's that at the top says assessment fun. Uh, okay, I, I, I see nods, heads nodding, so, so good. I think you can see that, thank you. Okay, so the topic that I'll be spending uh, my time on is assessment fun, uh, tailoring assessments to learning goals. Now, um, so I'm focusing on law student assessments here, and they normally do have a, uh, a well-worn path. Uh, we normally use things like uh, exams and research papers. Of course, for, for uh, MOOCs, uh, they're, they're, that would be a different kind of assessment. But I think we're all more or less familiar with the types of assessment that are used uh, normally. And um, the difficulty is, one of the difficulties with these types of assessments is that we are comfortable with them, students are comfortable with them, but the structure of the assessment is not necessarily that relevant to the learning goal. So I'm suggesting that to put uh, fun into assessments, and I'm, I'm arguing that this works both for students and for lecturers, um, and to increase their relevance as a learning tool, um, I'm suggesting that we think a bit further about the connection between the learning goals or outcomes that we want for students and the assessment method or assess the structure of assessment that we're using. So um, I'm, I'm going to review uh, some what I perceive to be some sui generis assessments in one of my courses. It's an elective course at the National University of Singapore, Legal Argument and Narrative. I'm going to take you through how those assignments work and, and how the structure of those assessments are related to the, the learning goals of the course. And then I'm going to conclude by uh, making some suggestions about perhaps how we can think about these ideas um, in the context of other course material as well. Okay, so we're gonna start out with a, a question for you all. And um, I, I'd like everybody to think about uh, how do you feel when you think of grading student assessments? <laughs> and I'd like you to be honest. Uh, and uh, you have, I think, uh, hopefully the poll will give you two or three words uh, that you can fill in. Um, so everybody, uh, please do fill in uh, in the poll two or three words 
that uh, kind of express how you feel or what you're thinking about when you you um, you grade student assessments. Okay, and I think we've given you one minute uh, for the, for to to fill that in. Um, yeah, and now we have uh, we have four out of thirteen people. Uh, the the miracle of technology. I know <laughs> I know who's filled this in. Uh, so please do uh, to to take a few minutes and uh, share how you feel. It's it's anonymous, so <laughs> you you can tell us uh, what you're thinking about, and then we can discuss. <clears throat> maybe we'll give um, maybe we'll give like uh, just a few more seconds for people to fill that in. So please do take a minute and just fill in a couple of words about how you uh, how you feel, what you're thinking about when you you grade student assessments, if if you do that, of course. Okay, um, organizers, I, I think we've got a few answers, so I think we can go with that uh, in view of the short time. So if we can uh, close the poll and share the results, that would be good. I think for some reason we can only see the numbers, not the actual. Okay. <laughs> can we? Is it possible for someone to read them out if we cannot uh, see them? Jaden, is that is that? Are you there? Hey, is it uh, possible? Can you hear to... me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Yes. yes I, go I, ahead. Uh, I can read out uh, read out the results. That that's uh, fine. Yes. The poll. Uh, the four answers uh, are repetitive work. The second one is difficult. The third one is a nightmare with an exclamation <laughs> mark. And the last okay. one is certain pressure. So, uh, certain certain pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. pressure. Yeah, okay. Pressure. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, thank everybody. That, that's uh, Thank you, Jaden. And thanks, everyone. That's extremely helpful. Um, I, I mean, I share some of these uh, sentiments as well. So why, why are uh, kind of negative issues or negative points associated with grading student work? Uh, we, you know, we, we tend to think of, um, of teaching as, as being inspiring, teaching in the classroom, but the assessment, uh, we have kind of negative uh, feelings, uh, ne negative issues associated with it. Uh, it could be based on student performance. Uh, maybe, um, you know, uh, students are are not so happy with their their work because they're thinking it's a bit unfair that they're really being graded on their abilities in the assessment method. So as opposed to what they've learned. So, for example, I think most people would agree that you know students tend to be better at say hypothetical exams as opposed to essay exams, or perhaps the the student work doesn't reflect even the basic material that we think we've taught, let alone an advanced level. Um, there could be also a less lecturer interest in assessment, grading assessments, as opposed to other parts of teaching. Uh, our learning and teaching is, is over maybe for the semester, if it's an end of semester um, assessment. Uh, and so perhaps we're a little fatigued. Uh, it may be the last requirement before we complete the course. Also, someone mentioned pressure that could be like a limited time pressure. Uh, we kind of feel like we're on a conveyor belt, uh, just kind of churning out uh, the, the, the assessments. Uh, no one did mention curve compliance, uh, but, but I wonder whether if you're required to do that, whether that plays a role in how teachers feel about this. Uh, and I think part of it also may be not just fatigue, um, regarding certain assessments that we're doing, but also the, the same kind of assessment, right? And again, like exams or research papers. So I'm suggesting uh, that maybe to put some interest or fund back into assignments and assessments and to increase their relevance as a learning tool, maybe we, uh, what I'm gonna suggest is that we think a little bit further about the connection between what we're asking students to learn and how we're assessing them. Uh, I'm not saying that traditional methods of assessment can't be used to good effect. effect. Of course they can and, and we do. But I think it's worth asking whether there's a more interesting connection uh, between 
the knowledge, skills, and values we're asking students to learn in our courses and how we're actually assessing them. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about a course that I've developed, Legal Argument and Narrative. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the assessment methods I've developed for this course. Um, in legal skills, it's a legal skills course, this course on the role of narrative in the law. It's an elective. Uh, narrative studies in general focus on literary aspects of what in legal terms would be called the facts. In other words, what happened. And this course uh, analyzes narrative structures in understanding and conveying what happened. Narrative plays a, a key role in especially common law systems of litigation. Uh, it features obviously in legal arguments and judicial decisions, uh, but most law students have relatively little awareness of it, let alone the concepts necessary to analyze it. Right? So that's, that's uh, what the course uh, is about. Um, it examines why narrative is an effective tool in legal persuasion, and it's open to upper class LLB students, as well as a variety of other students. So it's a fairly large course for a skills course. It's 40 students. And so I needed the assessments in this course to function also as a teaching tool. And uh, the course goals are, are laid out here. I, I won't go into um, a lot of detail, but uh, the, the students are, are um, wanting to understand the theoretical foundation of narrative, gain an advanced appreciation of persuasive argument, the role of narrative and stories in argument, and then go on to create their own uh, narrative presentations of facts, including the ethical implications of what they're doing. Okay, so what are my assignments then in this course? Uh, I have two main assignments. Uh, they are called the fact evaluation and the fact construction. Uh, to begin these assignments, student take, students choose a reported case to work with. So one case they choose on their own. They work with the same case in both assignments. Uh, in the first assignment, students analyze the narratives that the lawyers have used on behalf of their respective parties. And then in the second assignment, they take one party that they represent and they rework the facts using the evidence in the case. So they rewrite the facts of their case in a persuasive style for one party. And then they also criticize or critique the quality of their own work. Uh, the, the assignments basically build on and develop complementary skills, including objective analysis, as well as persuasive skills. Okay, so um, in creating these assignments, I could have made it a whole lot easier on myself. And I could have um, had all students do the same assignment, the same case, right? And that certainly would have been easier grading. But what we're talking about here is what is the connection between what we're asking students to learn and how we're assessing them. And I chose to have students choose their own uh, case. So every student in this course, every, every year it's offered, has a unique course that has never been analyzed uh, in terms of narrative before. And I've done this for a couple of reasons. It involves students in the case selection early in the semester, which really gets them going and thinking about narrative, uh, narrative very early on. Um, every semester, the students know this variety of courses and they become something that the student can speak knowledgeably about throughout the whole semester. And for my own selfish reasons, uh, it's also greatly expanded my knowledge of how narrative works in common law cases. Okay, so how do these assignments work over the course of the semester? First, students start out by getting the, get finding their case, and they do that. They select a case report with my guidance. In the first half of the semester, they learn basic principles of narrative. We also do uh, and I'm happy to take questions about this as well. We also do a practice assignment together in class using a different case. And then after all this preparation and practice, they submit their first assignment, which is a fact evaluation. And again, they're using these concepts that we've learned together in class and applying them directly to the case that they've chosen. Uh, I mark and return uh, these assignments over our, our semester break. And then in the second half of class, uh, we have class discussion that refocuses on particular concepts of narrative. And I hold conferences with students over the second half of the semester on their particular assignment. 
And in those conferences, I, I work with students' ideas. I help them develop the ideas that they will use in the second assignment. And then at the end of the semester, they submit that final assignment. So my experience uh, with, with these assignments, uh, which I have never seen kind of used in, in another course, uh, is that at the end of the course, students, first of all, have done original work. So it's challenging for them. It's also challenging for me. It is definitely not the same old thing. Um, and the other interesting aspect of these assignments is because students are choosing a unique case, they're all choosing a new case. I never have problem, problems with plagiarism uh, because they can copy all they want uh, from another case, but it won't make any sense in the context of the one new case that they've chosen. Uh, the other thing is that the method of assessment arises directly out of the course concepts. Students have to choose which narrative concepts are best suited uh, to the case that they've uh, selected. And the assessment directly assesses their level of mastery. It also, in the second assignment, you recall, I have a self-critique section where students explain why they made the choices that they've made and, and how they, they view those choices. The other thing uh, that I've, I've noticed in these assignments is that when students do assignment work with a case that they've chosen, uh, they, they, of course, they're doing a case which is different from everybody else. So they measure their progress against their own work, right? They, they measure their assessment against what they've kind of seen and what they haven't seen instead of uh, measuring their progress against the score that other students are getting. And I, uh, my perception is that the resulting experience is more satisfying and less petty, right? So you don't, in other words, have students coming up to you and saying, well, can I get another point for this? Or can I get another point for that? Uh, it's a different sort of inquiry. The other, the other aspect, of course, is from my point of view, um, at the, when I'm marking the assignments. And at the end of the course, I'm seeing what strategies students devised that, that they use to address their own case. And of course, there are students who do better and students who do less well. But I have to say, I'm, I'm regularly surprised and impressed by students' creativity. So even in kind of the lower grades, I'm seeing good uh, a grasp of ideas and bursts of creativity and, and interest. Okay, so let me just uh, kind of wrap up by saying how these ideas might apply uh, to uh, another course. And um, I, I'll give you uh, maybe uh, an idea, uh, two different kinds of, of ideas to assessment. So kind of a more fun assessment, a more interesting assessment for the professor and the student, but the assessment structure isn't necessarily connected to the core substance, which I think makes a, make a very strong uh, learning experience, but still makes it more interesting. So for example, in contract law, students could communicate relevant rules of contract law in an infographic or perhaps even a graphic novel uh, illustrating uh, how, how uh, you know, the, the, the problem that somebody got into with a contract and how, uh, how the law applies. So that's kind of the more interesting, that's more fun. But it isn't necessarily, you see the structure of the assessment isn't necessarily related to a contract. However, um, if you wanted a more interesting assignment in contract law and you wanted a connection, a stronger connection between the actual substance that we're teaching in contract law, then for example, students could find examples of contracts in their daily life. And you could have a class discuss whether they're examples of particular rules or, or something else. Uh, and then also perhaps um, I've, I've myself had students devise practice exam questions. <laughs> so this is quite an eye-opening experience uh, for myself and for the students. It's, it seems like a traditional assessment method, you know, an exam question, but it's really not at all uh, because the students are devising the exam questions, which you then kind of go over together uh, in class. And what we frequently uh, realize is that students have not clearly understood uh, uh, what, what uh, a, a contract uh, principle is all about. And so they're phrasing the question uh, in an inaccurate way. All right, so these are maybe just some examples about uh, if you are interested in pursuing a stronger connection 
between the subject matter and the skills and values that you're teaching in your course and the structure of your assessment, uh, how you might do it. All right, well, that's, that's all for me. I hope uh, you found that interesting and perhaps helpful. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Yes, um, so we have around five minutes for questions and uh, we already got some. So um, let me start by um, a question by Esther. Um, so you mentioned that you also analyze the cases chosen. Uh, where does this sit in the process? Do, you, do the students pick a case and then you analyze it and then you mark the student submission or, or is it something else? So reading yeah. out from Esther's question. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So uh, the way the, these assignments work is, <clears throat> it really, it's, it really happens in three steps over the course of a semester. Students first choose a case, which really has to be appropriate uh, for the assignments. And for these assignments, I don't wanna get into uh, too much detail with you, um, but um, they, they, these, these cases have to go into the evidence in a fair amount of detail. Because remember at the end of the course, they're rewriting the facts persuasively on, on, persuasively on behalf of one of the parties. And so they need evidentiary detail to do that. So I start the process off by saying, all right, here are your guidelines for choosing cases. Uh, and then I go over that, uh, that case selection choice with the students. And that also, also offers a, a learning opportunity. Uh, then for the second, the, the second step is actually the first assignment which is analyzing the narratives that the parties uh, uh, asserted in those cases and trying to say uh, what narrative uh, techniques were used, right? So for those assignments, uh, I, I do a practice uh, assignment with students in class, and then I mark them and I give qualitative as well as uh, a great assessment. And then at the end of the, the course, the students um, actually shift into persuasive mode and they rewrite the facts persuasively on behalf of one of the parties. And that, that, um, that work product is the uh, result of the semester long study of different uh, narrative concepts. And that requires them in part, for example, to choose which narrative concepts are really most well suited to that fact presentation. So I, I, I hope that answered the question. I guess I think so. Um... So when I invite others to ask questions, let me let me ask one as well. Um, so you mentioned about tailoring the connections between whole scores and, and, and assessments, but I also see that you, you have included a lot of engagement with the students you have you have given them. In fact, the evaluation tests, you provide them with interaction guidance as you have. How do you see the role of engagement and feedback in, in terms of this assessment process as well? Yeah. Thanks so much for the, for the question. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, I think the interactive um, engagement with students is extremely uh, important. And it's also, I mean, it's, it's suited to kind of uh, students at just about any level. I also teach uh, first semester, first year students, and they need a lot of feedback because they have very little idea of what they're doing. Uh, so they, the, So a lot of interaction and feedback is appropriate there. But also it's, it's appropriate uh, at the kind of the upper level the more with the more advanced students um, because they need, they need feedback on their work in, in order to know whether, because we're asking them to make more um, complex, sophisticated choices to exercise their judgment uh, in a more kind of complex fact, factual and, and legal environment. Uh, and so when they do that, they, they do need feedback. So, um, yeah, so especially I think uh, students find very helpful the conferences uh, that we have. Uh, of course, that's time consuming. Uh, and, I, and I know that that's, that's not you know, realistic uh, if your course is too big, um, but uh, it, it is, I think you're right, it, that that's a very important point. And um, I, I, I think it's, it's cream, extremely important and students find it very, very important. I think they find it more important than we do uh, to actually get feedback uh, and to make the process interactive. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got another question from another Wilson, Professor Wilson Chow from Hong Kong U. Um, he asked you about, from the student level, how, how do the students evaluate the assessments? Do they find the same level of fun as you might expect? I mean, how, how do they react to, to the assessments? The yeah, thanks, thanks so much for the question. I think at first, um, the students do not realize quite how challenging uh, it's going to be. 
Um, and I regularly, uh, I, I regularly uh, kind of share a survey with students in the first class, asking them why they've taken this class. And some, a lot of them just say, oh, please give us a break. Uh, we need a break uh, from black letter law. <laughs> So, uh, so I think uh, they, they, uh, some of them might have the impression that uh, the course is not very challenging because it's not a black letter law. Uh, but, but I do make, make uh, the challenges clear. Uh, and so um, I think they, over the course of the semester, they really do appreciate um, that, that it is a challenge. But, but they also, um, the students that have um, given me feedback, I mean, I, of course, we get uh, feedback on all our courses, but a, a number of students have also conveyed uh, that they really enjoyed the experience of working with one case over the course of a semester. So they, it gives them time that they don't necessarily have uh, in a black, uh, black letter law uh, course where they have to just keep on understanding, uh, you know, the, the, the ever expanding uh, set of rules. And, and of course, that's, that's what they need to do. Uh, so we're, we're appropriately pursuing it with them. But in this course, uh, because they get some time uh, to go back to that one course and think about it again in the in the course of a couple different uh, assignments, uh, so, some of them do find that uh, more more satisfying. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, with Daniel. I think we can conclude um, this presentation. Thank you very much, Helena, for sharing your experience, and and it's been very helpful. I, I mean, to to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up. Yeah, next up we have another presentation from uh, Barry and uh, 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 Barry will be presenting today, as I understand it. Um, so we're presenting on an Australian longitudinal study on the directions, developments and differences in the cohort of law graduates and lawyers since 2014. Uh, Barry is honorary senior lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law and a senior lecturer at the uh, University of New South Wales, Faculty of Law and Justice, where he teaches in the practical legal training program. Um, Glenda, who is not able to join us today, is an honorary lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law. Um, without further ado, again, I pass on the time to Mary, um, who will be giving us um, a very interesting presentation, I'm sure. Thank you. Hi, Wilson. Um, I hope you can see my, um, my PowerPoint um, there. Um, and uh, thank you, Wilson, for your introduction and particularly getting up early um, in Frankfurt. Um, also, thank you to um, uh, Ellen and Bonnie from the organising committee um, for their excellent work in organising this. And of course, the Chinese University of Hong Kong for organising this um, wonderful conference. Um, and in, in the course of my presentation, uh, I'd like for you to think about um, how your life has progressed um, in seven year stages and how time has moved. And if time moved in slow motion during COVID-19, then the past seven or, se um, seven or so years ago, past seven or so years is like an eternity. Uh, for it was in 2014 um, that I started my research project of then law students and early career uh, commercial lawyers. And one underlying theme from uh, the focus groups and the interviews that I've conducted in 2014 and also last year is what should I do with my life? Um, and uh, this was a book that I came across um, when I was living in England, um, when I was uh, taking a career break from law and um, working at um, a different, uh, working at the University of Warwick. And I came across this book by Poe Bronson, an, uh, an, an acclaimed American author, where he details uh, the lives of, I think, 50 or so people, um, mainly in America, some in the UK, as to what, what the struggles or the challenges that they were facing um, in their lives. And that was something that I think um, uh, this, this pro project does touch upon. I should mention that my research was originally a one-off when I started it. Um, I don't think I ever really seriously envisaged that it was going to turn into a longitudinal project. Um, and it started off in 2014 um, when I was able to recruit uh, 48 volunteers um, it was a qualitative project. Um, so you see there, I recruited six categories, sorry, three categories of participants. Um, they were um, LLB or JD students, undergrad students, um, 15 practical legal training students, 
um, so they were on the verge of being admitted, um, and also uh, 17 um, early career commercial lawyers. And at the time, they were pretty much evenly split between government and private practice. Um, and one of the interesting things was when I was conducting the, um, the early uh, transcripts, um, when I was reading them, I found that the themes were not just about uh, commercial law and relationships to legal ethics, but rather um, they were starting to expand into themes of uh, work-life balance, resilience, and the impact of perceptions of career success um, on their well-being. You know, when you meet someone for the first time and you promise hand on heart uh, that you will keep in touch. I'm sure some of us do. And I made that promise um, to all of the volunteers uh, back in 2014-15 um, when I interviewed them in focus groups or one-on-one. -on -one. And I promised them that I would keep them updated on research outputs, my conference presentations. And you can see here that uh, from the first stage of my um, longitudinal study, 2014-15, uh, I've managed to, I was really thrilled, I was able to produce several publications uh, that draw upon uh, my, um, my research. Um, and um, one of them was uh, published in a book, um, a British publication, Educating for Wellbeing in Law. I was really quite proud of, of that one. Um, and I'm hoping to publish a few more articles from, uh, from the latest uh, stage, which I will talk about in a moment. When I decided to do stage two, um, uh, I was originally planning to do it in uh, 2020, uh, but there are obvious reasons, COVID, but there are other reasons as well, logistical issues, um, that I decided to defer it to 2021, which represented the seven year um, anniversary of the start of the project. Um, and I really wasn't sure um, how many I'd get um, responding because they're all busy, seven years on doing different things. Um, and from the literature I was reading, um, you know, 70% response rate was considered a gold standard. Um, and I was really excited that 77% um, um, responded. So above the um, gold standard. Um, and interestingly though, I did get a low response rate from the lawyers who I interviewed from 2014. Um, 15, maybe, I don't know, I, it's hard to explain why not as many of them chose to come back. Um, but you know, it's their choice, it's voluntary. Um, and when I did was, when I called them back, and they were so, uh, I was so thrilled that they were able to come back, um, I asked them to reflect and contextualise uh, on their life, family and career over the past seven years, uh, their, their current situations, their future plans, successes, regrets and reflections. And I had to be really careful because I had wanted to be respectful to their evolving views rather than trying to have gotcha questions. Like I, the last thing I wanted to say was, you know, back in 2014, you said you hated commercial law. Why are you practicing it now? You know, that wasn't supposed to be like that. I, I, but I wanted to gently explore their change. Um, and what were the decisions and motivations um, that, um, that motivate, um, that drove them. But I also so should say that sometimes, and it can be with us, our decisions and our motivations are, can be quite um, inexplicable. 42, I'm sure some of you are here, are fans of uh, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and you know what 42 is. It's the meaning of life, <laughs> 42. I wish that my research, my longitudinal, longitudinal research provided the single answer to the trajectory of a successful working parent, a law graduate um, entering um, their career. I wish I could. I don't have a single answer. I'm sorry. Um, and, and this comment here by uh, Gustav, I'm using pseudonyms, when he came back last year, he, he said that you know, his career wasn't really a trajectory, but it was more a trapeze. Yeah, he was jumping around from one uh, to, to the next. And also in analysing my, my data, one thing that I didn't want was one, um, one explanation uh, to submerge um, the unique insights of each volunteer, because everyone's different. Um, 
um, each volunteer has their own story to tell. But having said that, there were some several themes um, that did emerge uh, through, um, uh, through the data. One recurring and dominant um, theme uh, that pretty much shadowed many of the participants uh, throughout the, the project um, is how the narrow and big law perceptions of uh, success impact on well-being of law students um, in law school and beyond as they go out into practice. Um, and I'll never forget this um, exchange between uh, two uh, government lawyers in a focus group I conducted back in 2014. And you could see there that they felt very, uh, their careers were considered second rate, um, unfortunately, which was not the case, but because they weren't working for a, a big top tier firm. Um, and, you know, I don't know what it's like in other universities um, elsewhere, but certainly in Australia, there is a, unfortunately, a perception in our law schools um, that, you know, that the comp, there is this huge competition to reach the big pinnacle of success by working in um, big law firms. And that can, I think, and my research has indicated that uh, it can impact upon their psyche, those who don't get into big law firms, their psyche is to you know, have they actually achieved success? Um, and I think it can impact upon their well-being, unfortunately. Um, and uh, Esther, um, who in 2014 was an LLB student, uh, she came back last year and, and, and she noticed uh, and she commented that um, I, I could tell when I was interviewing her that she had this she almost had this inferiority complex because she was a uh, she's a now an experienced uh, wills and estates lawyer, um, and um, you know, and and but she felt quite inferior to those who, because of the perception that wills and estate lawyers aren't considered you know, real lawyers, so to speak, but that there is that perception among some in the profession um, that you've got to, to be a real lawyer, you've got to be a commercial lawyer for a top tier firm. Um, so, you know, it was, was, I was quite um, sad to hear that. Um, but in some ways, I'm not surprised that those perceptions um, are out there and still out there. I managed to get some insightful comments in 2014 um, in my, one of my focus groups of um, LLB students. And this, uh, these extracts are from the focus group and um, they're from students who um, were themselves former Law Student Society executive members. And they quite admitted, they, they pretty much blew the whistle and said, yeah, look, there is a major link between um, uh, a sponsorship um, and big law firms. Um, you know, big law firms are there ready to sponsor the big events, uh, maintain their presence in the law school space and our psyches as well. Um, and I, I think that's where a lot of um, it, it starts. Um, and if anybody tells me, well, you know, advertising doesn't work, uh, then I'd ask, well, why do big law firms do it? You know, there's a reason for it. Maybe it works. Um, and Kane, uh, he was a law student in 2015, but when he came back last year, he, he pretty much was quite, um, he hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, that, that, law, that, psycholo that psychology is still there. Um, that, um, you know, um, yeah, he was able to draw on his observations about the broader uh, uh, cultural psyche at law school, where many students still um, think about being a partner um, at a big law firm, that they think that is being um, the pinnacle, that's, you've reached the pinnacle of success. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think he pretty much captured um, the, um, um, the environment very well. And Kane also continued, and here he's very frank, um, he was very candid um, about the disgust where he sees um, his friends, um, they've been um, uh, uh, burned out by the churn of big law firms. Um, and that's sadly self-perpetuating because 
for every one person who leaves burnt out uh, from a big law firm, a hundred others will step in. Um, so the system is still there. It is um, self-perpetuating. And the pull of the big law firm, or at least its pervasiveness was, was quite present um, in my 2014 interviews and focus groups. And here I was very fascinated by Freya. Um, she was a student in 2014 and she was very interested in social justice. Um, she wanted to work in legal aid or a community legal center. She didn't really have much of an impression um, of a big, um, uh, law firm and it just didn't really seem um, to, she didn't really seem to want to get involved. Uh, Crystal, um, in some ways, I think the thought in 2014, she was a law student, the thought of working in a big law firm appealed to her, um, but she acknowledged uh, that there were quite a few um, pitfalls to that. Freya and Crystal came back um, in 2021. I was really pleased that they did. Um, and I'll just ask, I mean, you don't have to <laughs> tell me, um, but does anybody like to take a guess as to where Freya, the one who um, was more interested in social justice, where she ended up? Anybody want to take a guess? Otherwise, I'll, happy, I'll happily tell you. No one wants to take a guess? No? I don't think I can see the chat, so I'm not Sure. Okay. I think they can send messages to the chat. So okay. It's, uh, it's, you right. probably have to have to <laughs> explicit. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to Freya. Um, well, I mean, Freya, uh, she she struggled uh, to find work um, after being admitted, um, but through much persistence, um, she ended up working for a big law firm, um, and she loved it. She enjoyed it, um, and um, but. After several years, uh, she ended up working for um, a, uh, um, a not-for-profit law organisation, which she loves. So it's interesting just seeing how her path has progressed. Uh, as for Crystal, um, she has moved to a big uh, law firm, but she set boundaries. So she said, look, I'm gonna, I want to maintain my work-life balance. Um, and um, as long as I can do that, I'm, I'm happy to work here. And her work colleagues respect that. Um, and I was very interested here by um, the comment that uh, Owen made as a law student in 2014, where he said, you know, if you're choosing between um, a, um, um, a, 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 a lower tier firm, you can't uh, ski uphill. Um, because you know it's, it's you should start at the top tier, and I was very curious by that comment because I wanted to see over the past seven years how many um, of uh, um, the, the the lawyers or participants in my research um, did they actually manage to move on from um, government departments? Um, did they end up going into top tiers, and and some of them managed to. Um, and some, some of them found it very hard to do so, um, but that's, that's what they ended up able to do. So I was really pleased that they were able to ski uphill. But I was very, though, uh, felt very bad for Harriet. You'll see there at the bottom of the slide. Um, she was the one you'll, I had on an earlier slide, and I'll just bring up that slide um, uh, there. Um, where Harriet, you'll see there on that slide, uh, she was the one who felt that working in government legal practice, uh, she was um, she was compromised, um, and you know I, I felt very bad for her because uh, since 2014 she tried to apply for a job in a in a top tier firm, but um, she was she was unsuccessful, um, and I don't know maybe. You know, I, I sort of blurred the lines of impartiality, but when I was interviewing her, I could tell that she was very despondent, but I didn't want to walk away. I had to sort of just talk to her for a few more minutes and say, well, look, you know, there, there's more to life than um, 
uh, than that that type of career. You've you've got to look broadly, and I really try to encourage her that you know you, you're not a failure simply because you're not working for um, a certain type of firm. Um, I don't know. Some people say I shouldn't have said that as a researcher, that I should be purely impartial. Um, maybe, but, you know, um, I, I do, you know, have, have a connection uh, with, uh, with the participants. Uh, Shelley, uh, Jason and Owen. Um, this is interesting because they, um, Shelley in 2014, she was a student, Jason um, and Owen, you know, for them, that, that they look beyond money, you know, money isn't everything. Um, and, um, you know, and for them, whilst they may enjoy their work, they didn't want to make rich clients richer. <laughs> and it was interesting to see um, what happened to them. Um, what happened was they came back seven years later and, and Shelley, she ended up working, she was in the public service, but she ended up working in financial counselling, um, where she could use her legal education and Canberra knowledge to achieve social justice. And you had uh, Jason, he worked for um, a commercial law firm in Sydney um, and he ended up leaving and going to, to the bush, regional New South Wales and working for um, a community legal centre there. Um, and you had Owen, he gave up law at a big law firm uh, to go to medical school. Um, I'm not sure he's making good money there or will, but for him, um, you know, he wanted to devote his time to helping more people um, directly. So that they're, they're providing that helping hand, uh, chasing the dream. And talking of which, um, I was really, I felt, I don't know how many of you here have students who are mature age students, and maybe they unfortunately experience age discrimination when they try to get a foot in the door. And um, Dwayne, um, he was a law student in 2014 and he came back last year and he found it really hard uh, to get his foot in the door. Um, but when I was interviewing him last year, I was really excited because he had, he was applying for two jobs, one in government and one in private practice, um, a class action firm. Um, but you know, it was interesting how, how, how the trajectory can be quite unpredictable. Uh, and sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for, perhaps. Um, when after about one, about 12 months after the interview, so just recently, Dwayne kept in touch with me. And he says, Barry, I ended up taking the job um, at the private law firm. And I was so excited. Um, and he said, but unfortunately, it didn't work out um, for various reasons I don't want to go into. Uh, nothing to do with him. Um, and um, so, yeah, but he's now in a better position. He's working as an advisor in politics and he, he's feeling more empowered. Uh, I'll just quickly go through because I want to allow time for questions. Um, I, you know, we sometimes read about lawyers who make a radical turn in their careers, like giving up their law jobs to run a cupcake bakery. Um, and interestingly, I, I didn't have, whilst I didn't have that radicalness to it, turning points, I had a few, like I had one, um, going, um, to moving from senior public servant to sole practitioner. And interesting, I had one who's a senior public servant. She's worked now, she's enrolled part-time um, in veterinary nursing. So that's, that's her passion. Um, talking about mental health and well-being, um, this is something that arose and it is a major concern amongst lawyers. And, and Esther noted, and I hadn't picked this up before, that for, for males, for the most part, mental health is dependent upon their career. Whereas for females, mental health is more broadly about life. Uh, and that's something I, that's, I'd like to explore more. COVID-19, how many of my volunteers were affected by it? Interestingly, not as much as I thought. Um, and Gustav made into telling comment here where he said, you know, if COVID had happened 20 years ago, there's no way we'd be able to function the way we did. Um, I think society really, really could have collapsed. Um, and what I found with uh, my volunteers when they were affected by COVID, um, most of them managed to uh, bounce back on their feet. Um, and in fact, so they've gone on to bigger and better things. And some of the lawyers, uh, mainly the females, they love the benefits of working from home. Um, so yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. I'll just quickly finish. Um, other themes that have arisen, um, I haven't had time to explore in this PowerPoint, but hopefully in some publications. Uh, proximity of bias affecting mums who work from home. 
Um, and there's still that unfortunate discrimination against working mums in favour of males who tend uh, more likely to be at work. Um, I had some wonderful comments, encouraging comments from um, the students or the volunteers who came back last year. Um, and um, um, also what I did was I um, he, he sent each volunteer a thematic narrative. So that was like uh, a transcript, uh, a story of their 2014 uh, comments along with the 2021 ones. And, and they loved it. It was like seeing their story unfold. Um, and I said to them, you know, I'd love to come back um, in three years, um, 2024. Um, that's 10 years anniversary. And they said they loved you. I originally said, look, I was thinking of coming back in another seven years, but I think somehow 2028 seems such a long time. So um, let's go for 2024. Um, so thank you for listening. Sorry, I was rushing towards the end. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, for very interesting, very interesting presentation. I mean, it's, it's, it's very impressive that you do such a good long presentation. So you're looking forward indeed to, if it's published, I'll be looking forward to read it. Um, and we have only a few minutes for, for Q&A. So I'll just shoot all questions to you one go, and then probably you can answer them perhaps in one big response and then we can Yeah, sure, there. sure. So, yes, I've got a few questions. First from Andrew Goop, that, um, do you gather any, any information about the participants' social class? Mm, so if so, what question. did you observe about the social class? Yes, yeah, yes. So I noticed that. The question is, yeah, so perhaps I'll ask all questions in one yep, go and then good idea. Yep. respond. Yep. So the second question is, uh, by Lee, uh, Lee Zhuyue, Lisa, um, about what impacts the uh, the study of the career path di on different students? Um, how does it impact you personally? Do, do you have any personal impact to you on your uh, on, on your study of the career path of different students? Uh, Wilson Chow from Hong Kong, you made a comment that it's, it's very impressive and, and he wants to know how do you motivate them to come back in seven years to, to, to come for an interview. And it's indeed a remarkable achievement. And my own question is, do you do, do some more? Do you plan to do, you said it's a one-off originally, do you plan to do more yeah. iterations in the future? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, thank you, Wilson. Um, well, firstly, social class, generally middle class. Um, I don't think there were really many uh, first I mean, there were some who were first in their family um, to study law. Um, in fact, I got a feeling that many of them were first in their family to study law. It's something I should have asked, but um, in more detail. Um, but certainly, I think many of them did have a middle class upbringing, and I guess that's a reflection of, of law school um, cohorts. So that, that's a really good question. I don't think any of them were like. Uh, filthy rich um, or anything like that. Um, I was thrilled though that one of my participants was a participant um, competed for Australia in the 2012 Olympics in London. Um, but um, he doesn't talk about that much. I mean, he's quite modest. Um, has it impact me personally? It does impact me personally because I teach, um, I'm, I'm a practical legal training teacher. And it's been for me, it's been a crusade to expand students' perceptions of pinnacles of success. Um, and I've been able to draw upon my research findings in, in, in um, the way I teach my students and say to them, look, look beyond a certain career path. You know, don't be unduly influenced by you know, the, the promotions or so on. You know, and I always say to my students, every firm that you consider is a top firm. Don't think that a certain firm is a top tier firm. You know, you, you, you know, have an open mind. Um, you know, don't, don't let your esteem be impacted by um, you know, what, what other people say are, are, are top firms. How do I motivate them to come back? Oh, gosh. Um, apart from a $40 Amazon voucher, I was just, I think it was about just keeping them updated for the past seven years with my publications. So they knew I was serious. Um, that they said, yeah, okay, Barry, so he's getting, we're being published. So they were able to read um, the data um, in published findings. So I think that motivated a lot of them to come. And just the rapport, keeping in touch with them occasionally through LinkedIn, I, I think it's really important. Um, Wilson, I want to come back in 2024. Um, that's the 10-year anniversary um, of the project. So uh, I'd love to come back. I, I, don't, I want to, so that's a three year gap instead of seven years. Um, and um, um, so, yeah, hopefully I can do that. But thank you for all your questions. Um, feel free to email me afterwards. I'm, I'm more than happy. And I'm hoping to have some publications generated. And um, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed. Thank you for giving me the privilege to present this to you.
No, it's, it's our pleasure to have you here in this conference. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, and, and please feel free to send emails to, to Barry. I think you'll be very um, um, willing to answer all the questions in due course. We covered all uh, within this conference uh, in the Q&A session, but I'm sure it uh, will be beneficial to, to have more discussion indeed. Um, so next up, um, perhaps, it's um, Dr. Esther Erlings, um, which is now shown on this video screen. Uh, uh, her presentation topic is is never cheating go to waste providing pastoral care to plagiarizers if you have watched the hong kong lawyer um, the short article on the promotion of this conference you realize that this is another featured conference presentation uh, in that very short article so dr esther erlings is a lecturer in law in flinders university in australia and uh, without further ado i pass over the time to esther thank you thank you um i will with see if i can share my screen with all of you does that work? And can you hear me? Yes, that's right. Yes. Excellent. Um, well, I'll start by saying that um, it's really, really good to be part of the CUHK family again for a short period of time. Um, I've done my PhD at Hong Kong. I stayed on for a little bit longer afterwards. Um, and so now I'm at Flinders University. Um, but of course, um, always very, very happy to be sharing things with my Hong Kong colleagues again. Um, so for today, we are going to look at yes, here we are. Um, a presentation called Never Let the Cheating Go to Waste, Providing Pastoral Care to Plagiarizers, um, and really plagiarizers who have suffered trauma in their lives. So we're not necessarily, although I will go into some reasons, but we're not necessarily concerned with those who deliberately try to step me in the back. Um, so what we are going to look at in this presentation is first I will talk a little bit about the academic integrity procedure at Flinders University, which is my university. Um, I'll talk a bit about the reasons why students plagiarise. Um, I also will then move to that concept of trauma and traumatic events and then how we can provide care for people who or students who have plagiarised. Now looking then at that academic integrity procedure, um, so the literature makes a difference often between two types of understandings of plagiarism. Um, an objective understanding whereby it doesn't really matter whether the plagiarism was intentional or unintentional, or a subjective understanding that it does matter and plagiarism is only that which has been done deliberately. Now, Flinders University updated its plagiarism policy in 2021, and we now, in fact, have a hybrid system whereby um, we have a procedure for what we call a misunderstanding, which is where the plagiarism was unintentional, but it is objective. Um, and we have a strand that looks at academic misconduct, which is where the plagiarism was deliberate and so subjective. Now, that difference is incredibly important for law because our law students need to report um, to the admissions board whether they have any reports of plagiarism on the register. And so our misunderstanding report still needs to be sent out, but there is a box in that report that we tick and that says, I have determined that no impropriety was intended. And so that allows us to actually follow up on this misunderstanding and put a report on the register, which is really a heads up for other teachers to say, this student has had a little run in with the rules already, but it is something that we can do without immediately endangering their career. Um, because academic misconduct um, on um, your file looks a little less good. Um, so at Flinders, um, we have each discipline has an academic integrity advisor. We have a university system as well, but the procedure is actually done by the teaching staff itself, or if you hear me refer to topic coordinator, that means a course convener, I think, um, in, in Hong Kong vocabulary. So what does that procedure look like? Um, now, first of all, we need to detect and gather the evidence. So um, plagiarism software often helps us detect the plagiarism. The evidence um, is finding the source. We then check the confidential register. So that is the university repository with all these reports. So we can see if the student has any previous reports. 
we then send an email to the student outlining our concerns. Um, unless the issue is very serious, then we level up immediately to um, the Dean of Education. But with our concerns, we also provide our evidence for what we think is a breach of the rules. Now, the next part is going to be quite important for this presentation, and it is the academic integrity interview. So what we do when we send the email is we invite the students um, kindly to come in for an interview, which is really a conversation to talk about what the rules are, what might have happened, um, sometimes the reasons we'll get to that in a second. Um, and once we've done that academic integrity interview, it's for us, the topic coordinators, to follow up. And that can either be, um, if it's a misunderstanding, our decision on the report and the penalty, um, and if we think that there was um, deliberate conduct involved, we can level up. Now, as I said, that academic integrity interview is very important. Um, and how that happens is it's normally um, a conversation that takes place in the teacher's office or in my office. Um, the student needs to come in that they can bring a support person. It's really important that that person is a support person and not an advocate, um, especially if the student decides to bring their parent. Um, staff can sometimes also have a support person in the room and that can be important because we don't get to report these conversations and sometimes you need to have another person who can tell you what happened um, we don't have any guidelines um, as to how long this should take so that also means there's very 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 practice um, some of my colleagues will have a student in and out in 10 minutes come in um, you know admit to what you've done and out the door you are um, and sometimes these um, conversations can take up to an hour, and that is more often the case um, when I have an academic integrity interview, especially when there are certain reasons that have led to the student plagiarizing. And the academic integrity interview is, in fact, an opportunity for us to find out what has happened, what the reasons were for the student to plagiarize, um, and also an opportunity for us to help them. Now, reasons for plagiarism are many, um, and I think the most authoritative list has been given to us by Park, um, with more recent additions to that. Um, so Park identifies, for example, a genuine lack of understanding of the rules for conventions. Now, culture is seen to play into this, um, although um, Karen Farron tell us that we need to be really, really careful because if we're thinking, for example, um, about specific cultures, there is um, a custom of oral transmission of knowledge, and that very often results in multiple students having the same story, which we, in fact, might misunderstand for plagiarism, whereas it is not. Um, another reason that um, is quite important today is efficiency again with students have the consumer attitude to their degree they've paid for it so they should get it um, time management a lot of pressure on our students um, who need to excel in everything that they do um, and there is also there the issue of institutional load but very often we actually give them more um, work to do than they can manage Personal values or attitudes come into play here. Some students think that plagiarism is clever um, and they might have the sense of entitlement, which leads them with that consumer attitude. Um, there might be defiance of authority or even the thrill of rule breaking. Um, and there might be an issue of attitude towards the teacher and the class, in particular when there's no trust between the teacher and the student. And when the student is in a class where they don't understand what they're doing there and they've given an assessment that lacks meaning to them completely, um, they're much more likely to um, plagiarize. The now and neutralization are important. Everyone does it, so obviously there's no problem with it. Um, temptation and opportunity have been identified, particularly through the internet. Um, from my perspective, that's more so temptation than opportunity, because the temptation is there, but the opportunity is actually reduced through plagiarism software. You can quite easily figure out if you've taken something from a blog post, whereas in the past, 
I'm not going to go through the 80 books in the library on a particular topic to see if you've taken anything out of that. Um, so the lack of deterrence is important. If the student has never been picked up on the plagiarism before, there's a cost benefit analysis where it might be beneficial to actually plagiarize. Um, lack of ability is often mentioned. Um, that can be because we admit students who are actually not good enough for the degree or because there are issues with teaching and learning with international students who are especially disadvantaged because of the language barriers. And then finally, that lack of confidence that a lot of students have, and they're linked with some of the issues that are already mentioned. Now, what have been identified as key reasons today are that consumer attitude um, and entitlement, the workload and the pressure, and then that lack of ability for confidence. But what is sorely missing from all of this is the fact that students might plagiarize um, in sort of a follow up from having experienced the traumatic events in their, in their life. Um, and although that's largely absent from the literature, it's clearly not absent from my experience because here I am talking about this very issue with you. So how do we get to this? Um, now, what is a trauma or a traumatic event? Um, and so Randall um, and Haskell talk about this and they say that this is not just a general stressful situation, right? Like a student having to take an exam and gets a bit freaked out about that. Um, a traumatic event is something that is so overwhelming that it in fact diminishes your capacities to cope. Um, it elicits intense feelings of fear and terror, helplessness, hopelessness, and despair. It can be subjectively experienced as a threat to the person. And very, very importantly, these events are not necessarily violent, but they always entail a violation of the person's sense of self and security. Um, now, that trauma can be underlying, but in this presentation, I'm broadening it slightly to also include situations that are unexpected and that are causing acute stress to our students. So what can we think about here? And these are examples, not necessarily all coming out of academic integrity interviews, but definitely coming out um, of the experiences I've had with students and the issues that taken to me. Certain homelessness, especially within the COVID pandemic, and it's not been so easy to find another home. I've had students contacting me, telling me that they now live in a tent. Um, escaping domestic violence, involvement in a court case, especially if the cross-examination happens in the same week as the assessment. Um, diagnosis of a lifelong illness, a natural death of a family member loss of job or financial security and also relationship breakup um, and that can make us giggle a little bit but we have to imagine that this is very often for students the first time that they are in a long-term committed relationship and they haven't yet developed the coping mechanisms of dealing with um, breakups in that respect now when we are thinking about these events, they are normally reasons to get an extension. So why did these students not just ask for an extension? Now that has to do with the way traumatic events and acute stress work on the brain. And I'm not saying this is a justification, but it's part of the context. So trauma or acute stress in fact impacts your brain functioning um, and your decision-making capabilities. Um, I've simplified things a little bit here because they're very complex neurological processes behind this, but part of your cortex gets deactivated and that means that your rational thinking ability gets deactivated. Um, so it makes it more difficult for you to make rational decisions. Um, your brain is also going to be expending the energy that it has to the stress response instead of to what we call executive function. So things like information processing, problem solving, um, working memory, those types of things. Now that is also problematic because very often the types of assessments that we set for our students also involve all these executive functioning skills. So it's more difficult for them to perform their assessment and at the same time they can't think very clearly about what to do when they can't get their responses in on time. 
Now, stress exposure has also been linked with increased risk taking for a reward, but that is a less clear link um, and depends on the circumstance. Now, so we see here we've got essentially the perfect storm for a student who's traumatized to um, break the rules of academic integrity. Um, and I should speed up a little bit. Um, and how though, when we ask them to come in, we are also dealing with the issue of in fact energy that's stress and what might be the response when we say, could you please come and see me for an academic integrity interview? Now we know that initially we talked about fight flight response, but this is broadened a little bit. So we might have responses to stress such as trauma that include fights, so if you get defensive, flight people will not respond to your email because they think if I don't respond, it will go away. Freeze, they sit there like um, a deer in the headlights phone that looks at um, trying to placate the person. So seven they're trying to suck up to you to um, get out of that awkward nature of the situation. Now, one of the big misunderstandings here is that we often think about the traumatized student as one who sits there quietly crying because their life has fallen apart. But that's very often not the case. The traumatized student, and we know this from family law, and we teach our family law students this, Aggression is a very common trauma-based reaction. So your student might in fact be extremely defensive and aggressive. And so at that point, you need to re-establish that trust, but the trust is already shattered because also from your side, you might be a little bit traumatized or at least feeling quite betrayed that your student has plagiarized on you. So a significant emotional labor involved there. Now I do want to get to the pastoral care that we then um, provide to our plagiarizers. So first of all, really important um, that we provide a safe space to share. So at this point in our academic integrity interview, it's no longer about the plagiarism, it's about allowing the student to tell their story, to gouge if they need, um, if they have a support network and if we need to interview them now. Um, it's also important to offer them actual support validation of their feelings, of their situation, but also realism about what can be achieved. Um, I think lecturers are often very tempted to tell people that everything will be fine and, um, you know, things, things will be all rosy again, and that's not always realistic. We also need to keep in mind that we are not psychologists, so we need to keep our boundaries. So then what can we do? Um, I'm going a little bit over time. I hope that's okay, Wilson. I can see your face. So if you start to look really, really mad at me, I'll stop. Um, what we can do is we can actually refer to students to those relevant services who have the expertise. So counseling services, we can discuss support with them. We should be on top of the student. That's my own alarm. <laughs> of the student services that can help. So for example, financial support or cultural support services. Um, if the student is in, um, in a dire financial situation, very often we actually have student services. We can even do very simple things like give them a public transport card so they can come to class. We need to be mindful of forms of accommodation that we can share with the students like extensions, or leave of absence from the university for a semester. But we need to also remain very, very mindful of the impact that those can have because some government allowances, for example, in Australia, Centrelink will be based on a certain um, enrollment in a certain number of topics. And one thing that I have always found very, very helpful is to make a realistic plan for other topics. Because at this stage, very often the student is behind in all of the topics that they're taking. So we sit down and we make a plan for when is your next assessment, can you ask for an extension, what can you realistically um, do in the period of time that's coming up, what sort of accommodation do you need. Now then, going back to what I said earlier about cognitive functioning, please, please, please always give them a piece of paper with that information on it because I promise you that as soon as that student walks out the door, they will have forgotten um, what you just taught them. Now, very, very quickly, trauma does not get you off the hook. 
um, you might get a lesser penalty. Um, you probably get a report for misunderstanding and not deliberate flaunting of the rules because our understanding is that that situational context is actually established as a form of duress. Um, so it was not a fully deliberate choice. What's also really important is the fact that you are going to have a report and a penalty is also a moment for the student to take responsibility and accountability. Very often they do feel very hopeless and helpless because their life has fallen apart. And this is actually a way to get them to understand that, no, I am in charge of my own life. And so why would you be doing this? I'm just going to hope that after this presentation, that's all obvious to you um, and stop sharing and have some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esther, for very informative and well-informed presentation, I would say. It's, it's, it's very comprehensive. Um, I don't see any questions so far on the chat. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just ask one. So do you see, are there any differences between plagiarism within junior students, junior students and senior students where they're supposed to be perhaps more experienced or they should have known a bit more about the consequences of plagiarism? Do, do you see a difference perhaps in the approach towards taking perhaps first year who perhaps don't know much about academic integrity rules? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so of course the first year students um, are much more likely to break the rules of academic integrity because of that misunderstanding and not understanding the rules. Um, one of the things that happens to me all the time is people editing quotations and they're not putting them in as a quotation because they think that if they change one or two words, it's not a quotation anymore and it becomes something else. Um, so, and, and we do tend to be a little bit more lenient towards the first year students, right? That's all a misunderstanding. The later year students, um, I think they plagiarize less because they are also quite mindful of the fact that they are closer to actually seeking admission. And if something goes wrong now, then we have an issue. Um, that also means that if they do plagiarize and you pick them up, the, um, the reaction um, is one of students crying on the phone and sending you 15 emails in 20 minutes um, because they completely panic. Um, I have to say the university has a template that we have to send to students who have plagiarized, it's just like the, the template sounds really, really nasty. <laughs> it actually sounds like we're going to kick them out of the degree tomorrow. So what I normally do is I send the student an email, I say, read this first, I give them the little heads up and then I send them the template email. And that I think makes a big difference, but unfortunately very often they read the second one first. Um, so I would say that if the later year students do plagiarize, they tend to do it more sophisticatedly. <laughs> Um, and so that, that's more difficult to, to catch, but yeah, that, that's sort of the main difference, I would say. Thank you. Yes, I think, and, and that shows how important, as you mentioned about pastoral care, because it's, it's really different to, to show empathy from, from the standardized university procedure somehow. That's right. Yeah. 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 I, I don't see any further questions from the audience, and I'm sure if they have, after we, they will contact you by email and so on. So thank you very much again for this presentation. Thank Mr. You. Um, now, I can move on to the last presentation by uh, Professor Tara Narora uh, on significance of systematic content analysis approach in legal education in India. Uh, professor Narora serves as a professor and dean of school of legal studies at Central University of Punjab, India. And I think he's now ready to give his presentation. I, yes, I saw your video and saw now. Um, good, I'll pass over the time to you, uh, Professor uh, Narora. Uh, who will be chairing my session uh, <laughs> coincidentally in the next session. Thank, thank you. Yes, and we saw the slides there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. I hope I am audible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, first of all, I would like to extend my greetings to our moderator, Mr. Wilson Lee from University of Hong Kong and my fellow presenters, Professor Helena, Mr. Berry, and Dr. Esther, and the audience. I extend my greetings from India. 
to all of you. So before I speak on the topic, Mr. Wilson shared with you, I consider it uh, as my duty to record the sincere efforts by the Chinese University of Hong Kong in organizing this event. And especially, I would like to acknowledge the efforts of consistently uh, taking care of all the arrangements and responding very promptly to address all our concerns and queries. And friends, now I would like to present before you about the significance of systematic content analysis approach in legal education in India. And if we look at the legal education in the different parts, different uh, jurisdictions of the world at present, it is more based on case analysis method. So when we look at legal education and research, in most of the jurisdictions, the case analysis technique is applied. And it seems more rhetorical than scientific and objective to the students when they entered practice and their professional exposure. And it happens because the influence of social, economic, and political forces also sustain this rhetoric that is based on interpretation of legal texts. And that interpretation is sometimes subjective. And here, the content analysis, this technique provides a solution to curb the subjectivity and remove that concept of rhetorics from the interpretation. Because the students usually find the difference between theory and practice if they are taught the law only through the statutes, the history of making of laws through the parliamentary debates. But if how the law is being implemented, it provides them an insight into the law in motion. While in subject in subjects or the courses being offered during their graduation course, they study the laws at rest. But there are few jurisdictions like in America, Britain, Australia, and to some extent, even in Singapore, the orientation and conditioning of law, law students is done through content analysis as well. While in other parts of the world, in African nations, as well as in Asia, the orientation and conditioning of law students in majority of the institutions is still being continued on the basis of literary interpretations of the statutory text of the legal texts. But if we compare the method of legal education and pedagogical tools the transaction mode of these three nations, what I could gather in my findings, in my interaction with different colleagues from these jurisdictions, the trends of legal education in the United States, Australia, and UK during last seven decades after 1950s demonstrate integration of systematic content analysis in their pedagogy and research. And this technique helps the students 
even within the classroom and beyond the classroom through the legal aid clinics to understand and to fill the gap between the theory and practice of the legal principles. It equips the stakeholders at graduate level, at postgraduate level, and pursuing their doctorates with the systematic, scientific, and epistemological information to support their claims, support their observations, their findings, which they draw on the basis of the literature, the study, the review. Basically, what I wish to present before you, that content analysis, as defined by Bernard Wilson, presents an objective, systematic, and quantitative description of the manifest content of communication and where it can be applicable. It is basically a technique that is added to the traditional interpretive exercises of reading a few appellate opinions or judgments and then commenting on their themes and likely to present their ground level impacts. And friends, while they read a collection of judgments, the students try to, the researchers try to find out a common thread that is running through all the judgments, depicting the, reflecting the pattern of thinking of the judges. And it curves the subjectivity and inculcates intellectual honesty and inquisitiveness in those underreported areas of the judicial process and its impact on the society. And it helps to identify the gray areas where the interpretations are moving on a particular site. So basically it is a law in context that is driven in the direction of a social problem to be addressed by a rule, then to the rule. So against this backdrop, what I feel that systematic content analysis also provides a scope for quantification of laws. By quantification, I mean in the form of frequency of analytical categories, which can be counted with the use of the database in the modern time, in the contemporary times, because the arrangement of judgment reporting is nowadays in the age of digital revolution is available to all. So the frequencies of analytical categories after finding out the variables on the basis of research gap is very easy. And these can be counted and then specified. And when these will be specified, these may reveal the interrelationship between the various variables. But this requires in-depth studies for the researchers. And one more scientific aspect provided by content analysis is that the observations which a research scholar or a student draws, these observations in context of interrelationship between the various variables are falsifiable, are replicable because other researchers who will be identifying further areas, further concerns, issues, of research and studies on the same judgments, they can use those judgments. And they can also try to identify the gap between the study conducted earlier and study now in progress. So those judgments are replicable, but the observations may be different. And this may help the legal fraternity 
to realize the purpose of research that is to contribute in addition of new knowledge in creation of new knowledge because in legal education this is not enough if we are going to transmit only what is the law in the books it has to be inculcated it has to be practiced and the students the stakeholders have to be sensitized that how law takes place at the ground level and serves its purpose in its functional aspects and if we look at now the nature and scope of content analysis after giving you a brief overview i have tried to point out about the nature of content analysis friends content analysis is inquisitorial in nature not expository because the stakeholder will be focus on inquiries about the implementation of laws and trying to find out a common thread in the judgments and that thread will reveal will demonstrate the pattern of thinking thought process of the judges and this is what in the law schools of the united states after 1950s had been practiced and then the observations which will be shared in the findings when these are reflecting a common thread certainly and that is with the support of quantified data and observation that these this much is the percentage of why judges are acquitting why judges are convicting why and what is the weight the judge has attached to a particular authority referred by applying the doctrine of stray diseases case citation and where the defect was in the framing of fir or the prosecution story so when these things can be quantified and presented in a percentile form the legal research will also ingrain integrate the scientific method of research by injecting the persuasiveness in the findings and then the hollow and the rhetoricism which usually alleged by the scholars of other discipline that can be caught because here by adopting the content analysis the another merit another virtue a beneficial feature is that it is falsifiable it is replicable it is reproducible because the data which has been reviewed that is subject to critical evaluation by the researcher in future so that is the real purpose of research if we can proceed now in my next uh, next part of presentation after understanding what is content analysis and nature of analysis i have tried to pinpoint scope and significance in content analysis we need to deal with larger number of cases it is not the right way if a particular judgment has been declared and and uh, pronounced and on the basis of that judgment we are labeling a court being a promoter of rule of law defender of rule of law or guarantor of rule of law that adds to the subjectivity we will have to identify the number of cases and on the basis of those number of cases we should try to identify that in how many cases selected by the researcher the courts have succeeded in defending the rule of law and guaranteeing the liberties so in this way against the traditional method of relying on a specific judgment 
the researcher have to gather large number of judgments and then trying to provide a objective measure of broad pattern in the case law and then to sort out identify the interrelationship between the multiple variables multiple factors and their impact on the legal system impact on the society at large and then its outcome in context of realization of the objectives so here how we can bring content analysis in legal research friends here we require cross sectional and interdisciplinary interaction the pathway to apply content analysis in legal research is first thing we have to understand that it brings the rigor of social science to understand the case law creating a distinctively legal form of empiricism and this empiricism is based on the findings creating one's own data based on the secondary sources and the secondary sources are clear before us in the form of judgments and these judgments across all the jurisdictions have been labeled as untapped gold mines for the legal researchers so friends content analysis provides us a better way to read cases finding the common threads that link the opinion and commenting their significance and it presents to us to the world some pattern across the material that is based on the pattern the observation is based on more deeply reflective understanding of the different cases on the same point and if we are going to conduct the examination of a judge whether he is a liberal or conservative judge we can take for example the judgments delivered by him for the last 10 years and on the basis of those last 10 years judgment when we try to interlink the relationship between international law and municipal law and the different aspects of jurisprudence and his judgments in the favor of the electorate or those who are elected government or those who are filing the suit against the government it gives us more thorough insights reflective understanding of the cases on the same point and here one thing we have to understand content analysis does not displace traditional method of interpretation it is different only in one aspect that we need not to rely on a single case or two or five cases for understanding the judicial approach towards a particular aspect but we have to gather more number of cases large number of cases to understand the pattern of the judiciary how the judiciary is responding on a particular aspect so scholars in traditional legal interpretatism used to rely on the literary interpretation of the given text of the single judgments but here if we wish to continue on the field of content analysis to ensure objectivity then the number of important cases and then drawing out the noteworthy themes need to be examined it requires the researcher why the researcher explain why the researcher took those particular cases and there should be some objectivity that may also tread some footprints which can be replicable by the researchers in future and the persuasiveness will depend persuasiveness of the observations findings of the researcher will depend on 
his ability to explain that why these cases were selected. Sorry, and Professor Rua, we have, we have to uh, end up wrap up shortly because our keynote is starting in two or three minutes. So can you perhaps wrap up and then okay. uh, okay, we'll, okay. we'll go to we'll go to right, sir, right, sir. Thank you. Sorry. So it is a unique legal empirical method, method of legal empiricism that also fulfills the requirement of scientific research by providing us objective, falsifiable and reproducible knowledge about what the courts do and how and why they do it. So the approach is based on the assumption that others investigation should be able to replicate the results of the research and also critically evaluate the gaps in the findings. Therefore, if we look at how the content analysis can be introduced, I have pointed out in, a, in conclusion that there are three methods, structural, institutional, and operational. Structural, that the syllabus, and uh, because in India, there are different uh, agencies who have introduced the, which have introduced the courses at the master level, doctorate level, and these courses should be revised in consultation with experts of research techniques from the social sciences. Then there are the different bodies. And uh, then third is operational method, how uh, means how the content analysis can be carried out. So selecting cases for study, then recording the consistency of the information, pattern of thinking, then establishing the reliability and replicability of the choices made during the coding and then analyzing data. So friends, this is all about uh, uh, content analysis from my side and what I feel that fundamentals of a research mind, I still remember the words of uh, uh, a renowned lawyer, Mr. Ram Jetmalani, who said to quote, a lawyer who knows law only is a mason, where a lawyer, if he has knowledge of philosophy, literature and arts, he is an architect. So in this way, we can understand. And uh, I would like to welcome the questions. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rora. I'm afraid we, we could not have uh, questions. I don't have received any so far, but I, I think we have, to, uh, we have to move to the other um, Zoom session where we have a keynote speech, which is, I think, already starting. So um, thank you very much, Professor Rua, again, for your very insightful anal analysis on, on the content. I, I do think it's indeed important, particularly in the context that you have described. Thank you.